Welcome everybody. My name is Debbie Davidson and I'm the Vice President for Workforce and Economic Development at Gateway. And uh, for many of you, this might be your first time to the Hero Center. Have any of you been here before? All right, well welcome. We'll get a little tour when we're done. You'll see the 911 Training Center. And the program that you're here to find out more about tonight is one that we started about a year ago. And we actually uh, started putting together the plans for this program, uh, developing the curriculum, making sure that it had all of the important components that most of the dispatch agencies in the area were interested in. So we did a lot of meeting with um, different agencies, talked about their hiring practice, talked about what they're looking for in an entry-level employee, what their hiring needs were, the job outlook for those agencies as well, so that we could determine whether or not it was a program we would move ahead with. Um, if you're familiar with Gateway, you know that all of the training that we do um, leads to a job. So we don't want to put a program together and find out that there isn't a job outlook out there. So we worked with agencies throughout Southeast Wisconsin, those within the three counties that we cover, and also uh, Waukesha County and, and some counties uh, farther away across the state. So we've had a lot of input from employers on what they're looking for in incoming dispatchers. And I learned an awful lot of information about 911 dispatchers, which is not my field, um, but in my position I get to learn a lot of, of unique programs. As we talked to them, we found out that there's some national curriculum, there's a national certification, um, actually a couple of certifications that are valuable as you're an incoming employee. And the agency said, if we had somebody coming in with those skills already, there's a, a lot of on-the-job training that takes place once you're hired, but you'd have a leg up, you'd have a real start, and you'd understand what the job is about, which is the most important part, because most of us have never set foot in a dispatch agency. Usually they're, they're hidden away in areas that the public isn't necessarily privy to see, and so we don't really know, other than what you see on TV, what a dispatcher does or what their day might be like. So with me today, I have some people that work in dispatch, because I can tell you about the gateway side of things, but they can do a great job of telling you what it's like to uh, be in a dispatch agency, to be a dispatcher or a supervisor. Um, they have trained people, and so they have some, some great insight, and two of them serve as a faculty for this program as well. So I'm going to start by, by introducing Laura Chase. Laura is a dispatcher Hi. at the Kenosha City-County Joint Services. And next to her is Josh Nielsen, and next to him is Michael Blodgett. Josh and Mike are both in, um, employees. They're supervisors, correct? Give me your titles. Uh, I'm the communications manager. Communications manager. I'm the assistant communications manager. And the assistant communications manager at Kenosha County. Now, because they're all from Kenosha County Dispatch, I don't want you to get the idea that this is only for people who want to work in Kenosha County. They do have job opportunities, but they share uh, the knowledge that goes on at the larger dispatch agencies, similar to what you see in Racine or Milwaukee or Waukesha, but there's also opportunities at smaller agencies where there might only be two or three people working. So keep in mind there's a broad array, and as they go through this um, agenda with you, you'll find out a little bit more. If you look at the papers I gave you, uh, the second sheet is the agenda of what we're going to cover today. Actually, it's the back of the first sheet. And uh, we'll refer to the different uh, pages and information uh, that's included in the agenda. When I get to work, I work day shift. So I get there at 6 a.m. and I start by punching in. And I go to either a call take position where I'm mainly just answering phones and helping the law enforcement person that I'm kind of assigned to. Or I sit a law enforcement counsel or I sit fire and county fire. We have we do everything there, so I can have a different spot every day, and we usually do. We switch seating, and so we're not stuck at the same place every day. And our morning calls, if I'm sitting call take, the type of calls that I'm usually answering are parking complaints, barking dogs, things that aren't real big emergencies typically. Um, it's what you would expect on, on day shift. And uh, lots of accidents, neighbor troubles, that type of thing, people bickering. <laughs> and on second shift, it's kind of a combination of that and the, the emergencies where people are intoxicated, they're fighting, there's weapons, things like that. And I think third shift, I, I haven't worked third shift, but I'm familiar with their calls, and, and it's a lot of intoxicated people and things that are a little bit more serious. So that's kind of how our calls go. But of course, there's everything in between. Um, when I do take a call, well, actually, let me back up a bit. 
when I punch in and sit down, I've got an array of things that I need to log into. Um, my computer, the thing that I actually enter the calls into that goes to all the dispatchers that need the calls. I log into my phone um, and it has a mapping system. So if 911 rings, we can pinpoint sometimes where the call's actually coming from. Depends on how their cellular phone works. Um, let's see, what else do I log into? My radio's usually up and running, so I don't have to worry about that. My email and, and just all the general stuff that you log into. And then that's when I start taking calls and, and actually working. Um, it, can, it can get busy. I mean, it can go from nothing to busy in a second. I mean, it could be really slow and your day's dragging and you're thinking, when is this, when is this day going to pick up? And then the phones will just light up. You know, maybe a big accident happened or somebody rolled their vehicle or, or maybe a shooting happened or, you know, you, you just never know. So you can go from, like, no stress talking to your, your colleagues to, to just craziness in, in a second, literally. Um, we wear headsets when we dispatch. Sometimes we do at call take. Most of us don't. It's more when we're sitting law enforcement or fire, county fire. When we're talking on the radio, that's when we're wearing a headset. So there's less background noise on the radio and, and that type of thing. Um, <laughs> when severe weather happens, our dispatch center usually goes crazy. Um, if thunderstorms aren't too bad unless there's high wind and there's a lot of damage, and then trees down, lines down, and we make all the notifications for that too. So we'd be calling the power company, we'd be calling the phone companies, the street department, highway department, whoever cleans up the roads. Um, sometimes we run out of officers, so you just have to throw a barricade down and go to the next call. It just depends on how serious it is. Like with the straight line winds that we had recently in Kenosha, I, I wasn't working, but it was probably one of the busiest days, if not the busiest day that we've ever had in our center. I, I tried to call in and the phones were all busy. I couldn't even get in to the dispatch center. I called 911 and my phone wouldn't even go through, it was that busy. So if you can, I mean, I can't really even imagine how busy it must have been, but if, if you guys can try to picture that, just phones, just dozens just lighting up and you can't possibly answer them fast enough. It's fun for me. So I, I would have loved to have been working that day. <laughs> I'm sad I wasn't. Um, yeah, and at the end of the day, we usually get a two hour I don't know what you call it. We have two hours before each shift where we kind of feel safe as far as getting overtime. I'm low senior on day shift right now. So at noon, if nobody's called in sick on the next shift, I feel safe that I'm not gonna get stuck to work until 6 p.m. <laughs> but sometimes it happens and that's, that's part of dispatching too. I mean, we're a 24 seven operation, so we have to have coverage all the time. And if, if the next shift isn't staffed, if they don't have enough people to cover it, you know, if somebody does call in sick, the the low senior person or, or whoever might be staying over for overtime too. So um, in general, that's about it. Um, if it does get really busy too, we'll try, to, we'll try to take a call and put it on hold and answer the next one just to kind of gauge if there is anything serious in those ringing lines. If there's not, then we can put it on hold and take the next one. And we just kind of have to prioritize and you know, use our better judgment and that type of thing. Laura touched a lot on, on on what was going on in the communication center, but what we're looking for for somebody before they can even get in there to, to perform those things is a certain set of skills um, because it takes some basic skills to be able to do, to handle that when you have, um, for instance, the night she was talking about, they had something like 900 phone calls come into the communication center in just a couple hours. Um, it was one of the busiest nights that we that we that we've dealt with, and you have to have certain skills to be able to deal with that. You have to be able to multitask, and when I say multitask, I don't mean do one thing at a time and prioritize. I mean you have to do five or six things at a time, okay, and you have to do them accurately and you have to do them efficiently, and that's those those are, that's probably one of the the most difficult skill set um, to determine that somebody has and to find people that have it. It's very difficult. So um, we do we do some testing, and Debbie will talk about that. Looking for people that have those that that basic skill. Um, some of the things that we're looking for, just in general, uh, ability to read and write, and speak English fluently. You have to be able to communicate clearly. Um, you have to talk on the phone. You have to talk on the radio. So if you can't communicate clearly, um, you're going to have a hard time doing this job. Um, you have to be able to hear and understand radio. You have to be able to communicate with the people sitting next to you. 
and again, that multitasking comes into effect because you have to do all of those things at the same time. Uh, vision, you have to be capable of reading documents, operating the equipment in the room, like the computers, um, ability to sit for long periods of time, working in an enclosed area. You have a couple hour period, like a storm comes through, like Laura was talking about, you can't get up and take a break in the middle of that. You have to sit there and you could be sitting there for, on a really busy night, you could end up sitting there eight hours before you get a chance to get up, that's happened. Um, ability to remain in control and work under stressful, in, in stressful situations. Ability to mentally retain information on a short and long-term basis. You have to remember what you did five minutes ago, but you also have to remember what you did, what you learned a year ago. Okay. Uh, ability to compile, analyze, record, and assemble data and information, and then act on that information. Okay. So you have to be able to know what questions to ask to get inf information from people. And then once you get that information, you have to know what to do with it. And some of those things we're going to teach you how to do, um, but you still have to have some basic uh, analytic abilities. Okay. Um, some of the basic job qualifications that we're looking for are um, somebody to be a US citizen, minimum age of 18, um, typically have a good driving record, be in good physical condition, minimum of a high school diploma, uh, no felony convictions. Some of the systems we use to access criminal history and Department of Transportation information, you are not allowed to be certified to use those systems if you have a felony record. Uh, vision, correctable to 2020, you have to have good vision because you're using computer screens all the time and if you can't see, you're not gonna be able to do the job. Uh, good verbal and written communication skills, like I said. Um, be able to react quickly and effectively to stressful situations. Some basic keyboarding, you have to be able to do basic keyboarding um, and have some basic knowledge and skills in operating computer systems. If you've never used a computer before, you're gonna have really struggle in this type of a job. Um, as far as Laura touched a little bit on scheduling and overtime, um, s schedules vary from department to department, from agency to agency. Um, some places work just straight eight hour shifts, other places work 12 hour shifts. Um, at Kenosha, we do eight hour shifts. We have three of them, like she said, first, second, third. And there's typically a lot of overtime involved. Um, Communication centers across the state, across the country really are not overstaffed. They're typically staffed at a bare minimum. So when you have people calling in sick and you have you know, people out on leaves, somebody has to stay and fill in that, um, that time. And a lot of times that can come in at the last minute. Uh, that's what Laura was talking about. So you have to be able to work evenings. You have to be able to work weekends. You have to be able to work holidays. Um, the dispatchers in Kenosha work a rotating schedule of four days on, two days off, four days on, two days off and then five days on and two days off. And what that effectively does is build 10 or 11 holidays into their year, but it's built right into their schedule. So there's no guarantee that she's gonna have Christmas off or she's gonna have Thanksgiving off. Most likely you're gonna be working those. Okay. So you have to be able to do those, those types of things. Um, and then you have to have an ability to pass some performance tests involving keyboarding and listening skills. And we'll be talking about some of those things uh, a little bit. Um, full-time and part-time, Debbie had touched a little bit on full-time, part-time. Um, some agencies do have part-time. Um, there's a couple of dispatch centers in, in Kenosha County, Pleasant Prairie. Uh, Twin Lakes also have dispatch centers. Both of those dispatch centers employ part-time dispatchers. So just within that one county, you have full-time and part-time people. So depending on where you're looking at, as this is a career, you, there are some opportunities to do this as part-time. Average salaries. I could, I could tell you um, at Kenosha, we start right around $17 an hour to start, okay? The top pay is about $22 an hour um, and for, uh, for a line dispatcher. Um, and then as you move up into supervisory positions, there's some more money to be made there. Some, some uh, communication centers around the state make less than that, some make more than that. 
Okay. So you really have to have, you know, you're not going to be rich or get rich doing this job by any means. You have to be willing to work your weekends and your holidays and to work some difficult schedules. Work a lot of hours, put a lot of time into it. Okay, I'm not trying to scare anybody off, but that's the reality of what this job is. Part of the reason we do this mandatory orientation is that you can find out a little bit more about it. Like I said in the beginning, a lot of us don't know what uh, dispatching is really all about, what their work environment might look like, what the shifts are like, what they really mean when they say multitasking. It's uh, taken it to a whole different level. So um, Mike is one of the instructors for the program, and he's going to build it back up for you now, right, and talk about uh, the training program we have. Um, this is the third class that we'll have going through, and we've been successful with the other two, with placement, job placement. In fact, one of uh, the graduates that went through the first class wanted to move out of the area. He wanted to move to New Mexico. He dreamed of living there. Uh, he got a job there and is very happy as a dispatcher. I work with his mom, so she keeps me posted on what he's doing. Um, and he uh, just got a promotion and just absolutely loves what he's doing. It's a really good career fit for him. So, you know, we hope people stay in the area and deal with our local economy and fill our local jobs, but it's also a very transferable skill that if you are looking to move where it's warmer, now that winter's coming, um, it's possible that these skills uh, can take you anywhere over the country and you would be expected to know the same types of things, work on the same types of systems no matter where you go. The work of a dispatcher, while everything that they've said is 100% true and accurate, you also make a difference. I know of two people right now who are alive today because of the work of some of our dispatchers. Laura is one of our dispatchers who has made a difference in the life of somebody. There's a call that I'm thinking of in particular who I know for a fact the young lady that was involved would have died if Laura hadn't been able to give correct instructions to some of her friends that wound up saving her life. Dispatchers can make a difference and they do every day. It's a difficult job, it's a tough job, it's sometimes a thankless job, but oftentimes we're the difference between life and death. And that, to me, is one of the things that keeps me going every day. Um, our class here is unique. You won't be able to go anywhere else and find the class that we have here. It's special. So if you want this kind of a class, you've come to the right place. Our class here combines a couple of things. It combines curriculum from an organization, it's a nationwide organization called the Association of Public Safety Communications Officials, APCO for short. One of the big names in 911. There's one other one called NINA, but APCO and NINA work very closely together. They set a lot of the standards for communications and for telecommunications in the emergency, in the emergency services field. APCO has developed this curriculum as a foundation for telecommunicators all over the country. Um, by taking this class, you will not become the world's best dispatcher. I can guarantee that. Uh, when you leave here, you will have a foundation. You will have the fundamentals for what you're going to go into your employer and learn additional uh, skills from. It will give you the basics. If you look on the little list that you gave here, turn to the very back page. Okay. Our class starts out with what we call a critical assessment. Dispatching, as I'm sure you found out by now, is, is, has, a, has a very specific set of skills that you need to, to have in order to be a good dispatcher. The critical assessment measures your ability to perform some of the everyday tasks that dispatchers do. You will have to attain a certain score on that, and Debbie is the one who ultimately has the say in whether or not you get into the program based on the score. If you look on there, we have some of the assessment modules. We have decision making, tests your ability to take a simple set of three little, um, or a simple set of uh, scenarios and determine quickly who you're going to send on those. Are you going to send the police department? Are you going to send the fire department? Are you going to send an ambulance to these kinds of things? 
tests your ability to think quickly. Then we throw in some data entry. We have to make sure you can type. Josh said, if you can't use a computer, if you've never used a computer, it's going to be very difficult for you to be a dispatcher. It's going to be almost impossible for you to be a dispatcher in most places because you have to have that ability to type and, and do some data, some data entry. So that'll be in there. Then they'll, they'll throw everything together. They'll couple that data entry with your decision making and interrupt you while you're, while you're doing your data entry and, have, and, and force you to make some decisions while you're doing that. Well, like Laura said, oftentimes she's sitting there typing, talking on the phone, answering her radio, doing all kinds of things at the same time. I test that ability to do that. We have your ability, we're going to test your ability to summarize calls, to cross-reference things, to cross-reference things by only listening to them. Dispatchers, a lot of times, don't have something written right there in front of them that they have to, or that they're able to read off of. We rely on our ears. We rely on our ears very heavily for things, and this, this tests your ability to understand what's being said to you and to make sure that you can copy it down accurately. Uh, some memory recall, memory recall of numbers, all while being interrupted by other things. So it, it, it's kind of, that, that's kind of mean, but well, honestly, it's what, it's what life is for, for dispatchers. Uh, test your ability to read maps. Um, we have this wonderful thing out now called GPS. If you have one of those in your car, a lot of people don't know how to read maps because they count on that little GPS. Well, dispatchers use maps every day, many times throughout the day. We rely on them heavily and you have to know how to, how to read them. Uh, some spelling, sentence clarity and construction, your ability to comprehend things that you're reading. This whole assessment will take all of those into account, look at those and then give a final score at the end. Uh, again, like I said, Debbie will take a look at that and then let you know whether or not you can advance on into the class should you choose to at that point in time. The class itself consists of a 40-hour class. It's called Public Safety Telecommunicator uh, through APCO. The different modules that are in there are listed under training topics. We'll give you a little bit of introduction, a, a little bit more in depth of what to expect should you go into the field of telecommunicator. We're going to talk about interpersonal communications and how to communicate with each other, how to communicate with people over the phone, how to communicate with people in person. It's very different trying to listen to somebody over the phone and get a complete story from them. Oftentimes you have to, you have to take into account the background noises that you're hearing or, or clue in on one little thing that they might say just almost in passing that turns out to be one of the most important pieces of information that they're going to give you. We're going to talk about some techniques for grabbing, those inf for grabbing that information, what to do with it after you have it. We're going to talk about the right way to process a call. There is a right way to deal with that and to, and to get the information from people so that we can send it out to our squads or to our field responders and get them there safely, help them to do the, the best job that they can and get the person who's out there the best help that we can give them. We're going to talk about the telephone. We're going to teach you more about the telephone than you ever wanted to know. We're going to talk about current telephone technology. We're going to talk about technology for future telephone calls. We're going to talk about how cell phones are changing the world of 911 as we know it. Uh, the 911 system that we have is over 40 years old. It was designed for the telephone on the wall to pick that up and be able to use it. It was never designed for cell phones. It was never designed for the things that we're asking it to do now. There are changes coming in the field of 911, and we're going to talk a little bit about those as we go through the class. Uh, talk about something called telematics. Anybody ever hear of OnStar? OnStar is an in-vehicle system that can notify us if you're in a crash and you can't talk. It'll give us your location. It can give you all give us all kinds of data about how fast you were going and the, the types of impact and the strength of the impact and where the impact. All kinds of information we're going to talk about that. Talk about our computers. Um, Laura said she's got all kinds of computers that she sits down, logs into every day. We're going to show you some of those when we get down into the, you know, our, our simulator here, when we get down into the, into the training center, show you what that is. Uh, talk, tell you, deal with how to talk on the radio. We're going to go into a little bit of how radios actually work. 
or again probably give you more information there than you're ever gonna than you ever would have wanted in your life but you need to know how it works you need to understand some of the limitations of the system you need to understand what it can and can't do for you because that's your lifeline to your responders and that's more importantly the lifeline of your responders to you should they get in trouble so you need to know how to use it and what it can what it can and can't do uh, we're going to talk about different classifications of calls what to do with different types of calls laura mentioned some things like barking dogs and parking complaints and shootings and stabbings and bank robberies and well that rate that's a whole big range of things right they're all handled pretty much the same way and we're going to talk about how to handle those things in the right way the same way every time because the more you do things the better you're going to be at it so we're going to talk about some of those things we're going to talk about the the nims incident command system the national incident management system you are also as part of this class going to be required to on your own time acquire two different certifications from the national Inc incident management system uh, we'll talk about that on your first day so you'll have plenty of time you'll have three weeks to deal with it i just have to know by the end of the class that you've completed it but these two classes are very important for dispatchers anywhere you go your agency is going to require that you have those so we're giving you a little bit of a, of a head start uh, toward acquiring some of those things talk about liability everything we do carries with it liability in some way shape or form and to varying degrees and how we handle things can either increase or decrease that liability and we're going to talk we're going to talk about ways to decrease that liability because we never want to increase it i say increase liability and josh shudders over there doesn't like hearing that and we're going to talk about some things that you can do to get ready for your new career as a telecommunicator all coupled with all of this we have a great simulator system it, it, it's fantastic the first time josh and i saw it it was like we we were very excited to see it because it's probably one of the tools that we've seen that comes that come as close as you can come to actually being in a dispatch center without being there so we're going to take that and you're going to spend about eight hours at least on that system doing the job of a dispatcher so you get a feel for what it's like you know what to expect you know what it's going to kind of be like when you sit down behind that microphone now granted your classmates are playing the parts of the callers and and of the the units on the road but every, just about everybody we've talked to as we progress through things they tell us that the stress level increases just like it would at one of our consoles because it it feels very real so that's one of the bonuses that you have of taking this class here you can get the apco public safety telecommunicator course anywhere you can take the critical assessment at all kinds of different places uh, a lot of places uh, require that as part of the job as part of the hiring process our agency requires that as part of the hiring process so you'll, you'll experience that a lot of places but no place else combines all of this stuff together and I think, and maybe I'm a little bit biased, but I think it's, it's a really good training package for somebody trying to get into this job. It gives you a good foundation. So what are the next steps in the process? You've heard a lot about these different things, Critical and APCO and NIMS and simulators. Um, the next step in the process, if you want to turn to the page that says, um, dispatcher training assessment schedule on it. The, the critical assessment is the one that Mike talked about that measures a variety of different tasks and abilities and capabilities and skills. It takes about two hours. Uh, we offer it at any one of our campuses. Typically, most people come to the Burlington Center to take it, but if Kenosha, Racine, or Elkhorn are closer for you, there's a phone number, and Kurt is the individual. His phone number's on there that you can schedule it at a different location if that's more convenient for you. The cost for the assessment is $100. And part of the reason that we do this orientation is we want to answer your questions before you spend $100 on an assessment because it's non-refundable. So if you're interested and this sounds like something that's a good fit for you, um, I'd recommend go ahead and taking the assessment. It takes about two hours. 
You wear a headset while you're taking the assessment because you have multiple things happening. Mike kind of alluded to, um, you know, you're typing away, they're giving you some information through the headset, you're typing that in, and on the corner of your screen something's popping up and you have to determine quickly, fire police or ambulance, who am I sending to this call? So it, it really does a good job of testing that. Also, um, rather than words per minute, it's keystrokes per hour because they're doing all different types of data. And usually we're in like that, uh, I'm trying to think of the number, is it 30, 3,500 keystrokes per hour? Um. Some, somewhere in that range. So it equates to if you're typing less than 30 words a minute, you're going to need some keyboarding skills before you take the test. And you can get those keyboarding skills. Gateway offers those at any of our job centers or workforce development centers or you can do a tutorial on your own computer, you can go to the library, there's uh, tutorials on those computers. So if you feel like your typing skills aren't at 30 words a minute or you don't know where they're at, uh, you can even do something online that just tests how fast you can type. So it'll give you a good measure um, of where you're at. So you take that two hour test, um, the scores get sent to me, and between all of the agencies in the area that use Critical, we ask them what are their cut scores. So what do they consider an acceptable candidate for hire? We averaged out the scores because there was some difference between agencies. Uh, we averaged those out and then uh, we made that our cut score. And the agencies you know, agreed that that was a good solution because we're serving so many different uh, agencies and not just one. So I look at your scores relative to the cut score uh, and it tells me either pass or fail on there, but I also know what your raw score was. So if you are close in some areas by maybe a percentage point or two, it automatically says fail. We look at it more closely and say, okay, you're very close in this area or your typing skills were off by like 20 keystrokes per hour. Uh, we tell you that's something for you to brush up on, make sure that you're doing something to improve in that area, but we'd allow you to register for the class. Nobody registers for the class until they hear from me that they passed the test or that they're accepted into the program um, because that's our prerequisite for that. So we want you to take the test. Otherwise, if you were to register for the program, you're going to find very quickly once you turn those computer simulators on and you're sitting there that, that you're going to falter at it. And we want people to be successful, so that's why we've put these steps in place. So you, uh, you have to call in advance or go to the campus to register for the test. Typically, we have five licenses at every one of the locations. Uh, but we don't do just a walk-in because there might be other people there that are taking it as well. So you have to, uh, if you're paying by credit card, you can call in advance and reserve. If you're paying by something other than credit card, you would go there and reserve a, a certain time slot and then come back to take the test. Questions on the test at all? Mm -hmm. um, is typing speed very important before you take the test? Yes, I would say yes, and Josh is going yes. <laughs> Yes, it is, it is important. I would say that's the bare minimum, wouldn't you? I know you do keystrokes per hour, so you have to equate that. What we're looking for is, in the critical, it's looking for a certain score, but the critical takes some other things in the fact to, um, when it factors your score in there. If we're looking at just a straight data entry test for Kenosha, you're looking at 6,200 keystrokes per hour at 95% uh, accuracy to pass just our straight data entry test. When we get into critical testing, we're looking at, I think it's, I think it's like around 3,700 words per minute, but that takes into consideration the fact that the computer's throwing other things at you while you're trying to do your data entry. Right. It's, it's not, not straight, straight data, data entry. entry. It's not straight data entry. Yeah. So if you're looking at just a straight data entry, if you're, if you can get up in the, if you're up in the area around 6,000 keystrokes per hour with a very minimal error rate, then you're, you're doing good. If you're at 30 words per minute when you start this program, and it is only a few weeks in length, but you can continue to work on when you're not in this class, continue to work on your typing speed and your, and your accuracy as well. So there are tutorials for you to use um, to, to bring those skills along. Okay, other questions? All right, and then uh, on the back of that page, or on the next page, you'll see uh, the training and the training dates. Um, there are two courses conveniently named Public Safety Telecommunicator 1 and Public Safety Telecommunicator 2. Um, each of them is 24 hours in length. You have to take one before you take two. We 
run them back to back. Um, and the dates are on there and the cost is on there. Uh, the first course is $324. The second course is $235. So it's a total of $559. And it includes your textbook. Um, and the meeting dates are on there. So we have the class Monday, Tuesday, and Thursday evenings, and then Saturdays for a full day. And I think this covers a three-week time period that you're meeting. So um, three Saturdays, just so you know in advance. Um, it is fast-paced. We're packing a lot into this, and so attendance is really critical. If for some reason there is an emergency in Kenosha and the instructors have to stay there because they're not allowed to leave the dispatch agency, um, then they coordinate makeup dates with you that is agreeable to everybody in the class. The other, uh, the NIMS certifications they talked about, those are free online. So it's something that you do on your own time, and they're free, and once you're in the class, they'll give you the login information, where to find it, how to access it, um, and it's something that you do on your own time so that when you're done, you have the APCO certification and the two NIMS certifications as well. But they don't do that as part of the class because it's self-directed and it's meant for you to be able to do on your own time. The next step, like I said, would be scheduling the critical assessment and then once you hear from me, you can register for the program and I send you registration information. If you've gone to Gateway before and you have a student ID, we do it through WebAdvisor online. If you've gone to Gateway and you haven't been here for a while, I'll show you how to do it on WebAdvisor. Um, so we'll, you know, we'll work through the registration process with you and I'll walk you through.